miss the Beyond I Do podcast. That's not a bad thing. We yeah. just had this conversation in Beyond I Do. I married a woman with kids. With yeah. kid. I'm not saying that With it's kid. bad, but he was just like, I, I see you marrying a man that already has kids. I'm like, Dang, that could be a prophetic that's word. Good. It's not a All right. You can, I think I it may it. You're getting older, Chelsea. <laughs> 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 Your choices are getting limited. <laughs> they are. They really are. So sad. Listen, I'm the mission kidding. field is proven to find a man. I, I mean, know. Mm. With, with a P. <laughs> yep. yeah. right. I'm going on the next he mission trip. Don't worry. I'm going on the next mission trip. meet a missionary. Well, listen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you might meet a guy in the Ghana, Ghana? or Nigeria. <laughs> where, 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 where's our missions over at Nigeria, right? You got, yeah. you got Uganda, that. Nigeria, yeah. Nigeria. Yeah, yeah. Say less. Some choices. <laughs> hey, he might like that green card. I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> He's not gonna be American either. Oh, you're gonna Lord. Get with Chelsea. <laughs> yes, pastor. He's a, a man of God. Yeah. Everything on your list. Mm-hmm. He has three kids. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. Three? He has three kids. Nah, I'm sorry. He's a widow. He's a widow. How old is he? Oh, well, now that's kind of a come up. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the, you know, if you don't ever have to deal with the, the you know, the baby, the, the baby mama drama. or the baby daddy, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. it's a blessing. So, <laughs> you know, like. But I told Chelsea's if he was a widow, okay, that could widow be a blessing. Incarceration. I mean, it's, 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 well, a little, well. How long is he incarcerated? Oh, <laughs> Lord, no. Next topic, I'm or she. Uh, how long is she yeah, incarcerated? Yeah, exactly. In Chelsea's case, how long is the baby mama incarcerated for? Why is three kids yeah, too much? I'm 26. That's too many kids. We just had a Beyond I Do episode with Kim and Gage. He was, they he were was 25. Older, though. No, he's the young. He's, he's only 30. Mm-hmm. And he has an 18-year-old now. okay. Better watch it. No, they- <laughs> Better watch it. <laughs> Better watch that judgmental well, they- spirit of yours. <laughs> For the Lord deals with your heart, gives you exactly what you won't receive. <laughs> Just to teach you a lesson. <laughs> oh, Lord. Moving on. Next topic. I'm going to talk about my love life. <laughs> he going to the deliverance service with you. Right? <laughs> yeah, oh, exactly. Lord. Exactly. Yeah, anoint you. All right, everybody. Welcome to Beyond the Letter. Thank you so much for joining us today. As always, we appreciate you guys being a part of the Beyond the Letter family. And uh, like we've shared, thank you so much. We've had some great wins Mm -hmm. uh, this past month in terms of our outreach. And Beyond I Do has done a lot of great episodes. Beyond the Letter has had a few which is interesting. We've had because we did one episode one time on demons and possessions, oppression and stuff like we've done a few episodes like that. But I want to say like maybe three months ago with Caleb, we had one or something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. It, it's called Possessions. So, <laughs> you know, it's interesting that we did that a year ago, I okay. think. Uh, it, it, we either did one because we did one a year ago and we did one three months ago. Mm-hmm. Whatever it was, one of those charted really high on international charts like in Ireland and in uh, a couple other places. So what's interesting wow. is probably people during Halloween are just yep. looking mm-hmm. up stuff 100%. on podcasts yeah. and stuff and came across ours. So um, that's why labeling your podcast correctly is very important, you know, because people are always searching it. Mm -hmm. So for Beyond the Letter, we have one new special guest friend, homie, hanging out with us today, (laughs) LaCrease. We call her Pastor LaCrease because she's on staff with us at our church, Abundant Living Family Church. And she helps lead our international missions, local outreach, local missions, All things under everything outside of the church four walls, being the the hand, if we would call it the hands and feet of Jesus to, you know, reach people either for the gospel or their natural needs, Mm -hmm. you know, like food or clothing (laughs) or shelter or whatever else that may be. So Pastor Mm -hmm. LaCrease leads that up. Yes. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Thank you for having me. You pull your mic closer to you. Yeah, yeah. You'll you'll learn it. Well, it's soft. (laughs) (laughs) It'll be all right. (laughs) It's like eating an ice cream cone. That's how you want to talk on a podcast. (laughs) Okay, okay. Like you're eating ice cream. (laughs) Yeah, well, welcome. Uh, Thank you for welcoming me uh, here. All right. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for hanging out with us. Mm-hmm. And then we got Chelsea in the room. What's up, y'all? We got Aaron co hosting with me yo, today, yo. wearing his, he stole his son in law's hat before <laughs> filming today. Yeah. Who's Colin, who's been on this before? Yeah, yes. I'm considering firing him from the <laughs> podcast, oh. not from employment. <laughs> But just from I was like, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I was like, wait, whoa, we're doing that on 
No. I told him in a group chat with Aaron that he's no longer invited. Cause oh, because you sent him the other invite. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I asked him last week to be on. He said, hey, I'm in Mexico at a wedding. I said, listen, yep. get your priorities in order, <laughs> Colin. <laughs> if you respect beyond the letter, then you jump on that PJ. Mm -hmm. I told him, you jump on the PJ. You don't even got PJ money. For those that don't know, that's private jet. Yep. So you jump on that private jet. I can't. You, you pop over <laughs> here. PJ. You pop over here. Talking about Pastor John. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> jump on jump Pastor on John. John. <laughs> like, jump Pastor on John can fly. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine him just you know, get to where I say, you jump on that PJ. Yep. You be here. You get the podcast done. You yep. can go back to your wedding. Yep. He's like, I don't got money for that. I said, well, you're no longer invited to the podcast. <laughs> right. Priorities. I, 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 I will say, and I was talking to, to Gabe and Jermaine about that. These new employees at ALFC are so spoiled. Oh, yes. They yeah. get text messages. Get so mad. Hey, are you available? Here's the topics of discussion. Would you consider joining the podcast? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. why don't I get text messages like this? Yeah. That's because no. we didn't have phones to text like that. <laughs> <laughs> she called you old. <laughs> Deep. Yeah. She said, you too old to text back. Yeah, got it, got it. Got it. No, I told I told Aaron, he's part of the big leagues. Part of, part of the role is that you're not, you don't allow, you don't get prep. Yep. You don't get prep when you're on when they're on the big boy squad. But these the new the new ones that you know you gotta they, they sweat a little more. So <laughs> you gotta give them a little more lead in. Like, hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing. Yeah. And I'm getting you know I'm becoming a veteran at this game called podcasting. Okay. So I'm uh, you know I'm over a hundred hours into this thing. You feel so me? I know I know who I can throw stuff on and I know who I can't. Because mm -hmm. I used to treat everyone like you're all going to get th stuff thrown on you. And you see people just start sinking in their seat. <laughs> you know, they start falling into the abyss of the wall, you know, hoping that no one, you know, speaks Looks to at them, them at all. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why it's always like, oh, yeah, I'll give you I'm going to throw softball over here, here it, until you it. get your, you know, until you get your ground and you open up and you. you get loose on it. Even my dad, who's like an OG, OG veteran communicator. The times he's been on the podcast, he was always like, that's just a completely different animal. You have to be yeah, on, thinking at all yeah, times. Yeah. You know, you don't get a single mental break. And nowadays with us in technology, like even when I go to lunch with friends, if I, if it's a, with a regular friend, you know, half the time we're talking, but half the time I'm also on my phone, you know, kind of mm -hmm. just trinkling around on Instagram or whatever. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How was your kid's party or whatever? So, you know, we're so keen nowadays that we come in and out of consciousness so many times throughout yeah. the day that to sit down for two hours and have a full legitimate conversation takes so much mental energy mm -hmm. you know so i've seen what people would do they come on and you don't give them any kind of you know foothold and they just they, they, they fall <laughs> they fall they yeah. shrink yeah, yeah they yeah, shrink sure. and they sink and then we got jermaine in the house and gabe oh gabe's sitting there hopefully we get yeah, yeah. gabe on the mic today yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Speak. he always with them <laughs> did you speak <laughs> speak <laughs> It's not, it's, on, not on, it's not on. It's not on. It's not on. Jermaine oh. didn't do his job. Jermaine. Well, all my right. Bad, my bad. My bad. Everybody, what, what's your role here on the podcast, Jermaine? It's uh, audio. Audio spectator. Is it audio <laughs> Hey, everybody. We'll be looking for a new audio <laughs> spectator. So, if any of you guys specialize in that, um, send your resumes to Jermaine. He'll interview his uh, before Stop. he outgoes. He'll pick his replacement. <laughs> <laughs> oh Can you hear me? Well, I oh, didn't wow, do nothing. Oh, okay. I didn't well, press nothing. May the Lord be a witness. You're lying, to this. bro. No. You it. it was green for go. I showed it. I showed it to everybody. Come on, this is the show within the show. Why are you guys bickering? <laughs> You're right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. First things first. I want to deal with one thing. Okay. Okay, because we all call Pastor Lacrise Pastor Tutu. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it T U T U or two two number two two? So it's T U T U. Right. But we will use the two two, the two, number two. Because um, that's what the California shorten. license plate Basis. allows. Because your, your license <laughs> yeah, plate has two two on it. <laughs> yeah. And that used to be your street name. Yes. It was a birth nickname, right. but the streets found out mm. and um, they started to call me that. Uh, what, so. what, 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 what neck of the woods did you grow up in? <laughs> I grew up in La Puente. Oh. But left home, because I left, if you know my testimony, I left home at the age of 13 and then moved to L.A. And I was on 2nd Avenue Jefferson mm -hmm. um, for a 
great period of my, my life living with my grandmother. And so, yeah, so Did you get you move there because you were a troublemaker? <laughs> the eyes. You thought it was missions work? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Whoa, man, yeah. that was a mission, though. Yeah. Um, no, I well, I was a troublemaker. I rebelled at a very young but age. But is that why you left at 13? Yeah. Okay. That was bad. I was that one heathen child. It was just, get her out of here. Yeah. Go live with Graham Graham. She didn't send me. I, I ran oh. away. And when I ran away, she found me. My mom found, my mom and dad found me the first time. And then the second time, I got smart. And she's like, I'm not going to call home. That's when caller ID first yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> came out. So I was like, I'm not going to call home because then they'll know. And then I, I end up moving to my, with my grandmother. And so you're mixed. What's your mom? My mom is um, Spanish. From Spain? Yes. Oh, okay. Spaniards. Uh, yes. Espana? Mm-hmm. Okay. And then your dad is? African-American. Okay. And he originated from, or originally from um, Dallas, Texas. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And so Graham was from the Spanish side or the black side? The black side. Okay. You mean the one that I moved Yeah, because only a black Graham oh, would take, you know, yes. a heathen child. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. My grandmother on my dad's side. That is very true. <laughs> yes. My, my mom's mom, she would have been like, Gloria, your daughter is over oh, here. Yeah, you yeah. better come and yeah. get yeah, her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, like, yeah. I'm like, there's no My way. My dad's side was like, okay, honey, go on in there and make you some bread. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell a soul. <laughs> okay. I, I won't yeah. tell your mom. Your yeah. mama's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all of a sudden on your side. Yeah. Dang. Yeah. Okay. So you were mm-hmm. out, you were out running south side of LA. Yep. During okay. what, what years? Um, would you During been the riots. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So I was gangbanging by the age of 16. No. Yeah. What does gangbanging look like for a female um, in that side of town? It was, ooh. So gangbanging for um, that side of town was really, uh, we, we were the one. we were the lookouts. We were the ones who, um, you know, when they did their dirty work, transport. Because mm-hmm. they they're not gonna yeah, mess with your little purse or whatever, mm-hmm, yeah, purse, stuff like that. Um, we we had to we had to fight a little to get in, wow. yeah, yeah. So yeah, but I was known for that. Like mm-hmm. even through elementary, junior high school, when my mom's phone rang, she knew it was because of me. Really? Mm-hmm. Dang. Yeah. yeah. Graham Graham was religious. Um, no. Which one? The one you were living with. No. Oh. Not until maybe the last maybe 10 years of her life that oh she my came to know the Lord. Hmm. Um, so when you so, were on the South Side of LA, hmm. like there was no, uh, for lack of a better word, consciousness no. in your area of influence. No. Wow. Because, mm-hmm. you know, at times you got some uh, some people are on the streets, but they're like, yeah, every Sunday I'm with my grandma and my grandpa, and they're bringing me down to the Baptist church on the yeah. corner. Mm-hmm. My what grandfather, I'm, yes, he was a deacon. Um, he ended up it, having a stroke. Your grandma's wa- husband? Yeah, but she they were married. Mm-hmm, but she didn't go. And he would go to church. She wouldn't go. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's rare. Yeah. Yeah. Especially Why wouldn't she? That. Especially, yeah. I don't. I I have the slightest idea. I never. Oh my gosh. Yeah, but she didn't. She didn't go. My grandfather did though. That to say, before we lead into some other questions mm-hmm. I got on missions and stuff okay. like that, I got a video <laughs> that was to be going viral. I want to know what's going on with your town. I was going to give this to Pastor Julian Lowe originally. Uh oh. Okay. But then I decided, when we decided to do our little paper game, I then decided, I'm going to give this to Tutu. <laughs> Tutu. Because your city is going crazy. Did you guys hear about the guy that was robbed off the 10 freeway in the middle of traffic? No. Y'all didn't hear about this? Oh, pulled off on the side on the side of the freeway on the right. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah. They they well they hit him, mm-hmm. pushed him off the side of the road, and rock, took everything. Mm-hmm. The car off of them, like literally hit their car off the road on mm-hmm. the ten freeway in traffic, just to take stuff from them, just wow. to steal. Don't know they didn't know him. They didn't. They just straight broad daylight robbing. I got the video, so we're gonna play it. Oh, okay. Now I want to know. Was that like the 90s for you, or is this another world we're living in right now? Because I, I feel like L.A.'s Gotham City right now, okay? I just When I be going over there, I'm just like, this is Gotham City. This is a crazy place. Okay. But I, let, let's play the video, uh, Andy, which, by the way, we have Andy here. Thanks, Andy. Let's <laughs> play. <laughs> this is the shocking moment an L.A. driver was driven off the road and then robbed in broad daylight as he kneeled on the road with his arms in the air. 
A passenger in a passing car filmed the terrifying moment the robbers surrounded the victim and began rifling through his vehicle after it was rendered disabled. The incident occurred just before 1.30 p.m. on Tuesday when a black Dodge Caravan, occupied by four men with ski masks, intentionally crashed into a black-colored Alfa Romeo on the eastbound I-10 west of Arlington Avenue in South Los Angeles. Authorities said the suspects, who were armed with a hammer and a crowbar, then fled from the scene in a white Chevrolet Malibu and were last seen traveling east on the I-10. Wow. Ooh. Like, this is the world we live in nowadays. Yeah, that's crazy. This is, and in particular, this is a big California problem. More than, in Northern California is a mess. Southern California is a mess. The big cities are a mess, particularly San Francisco and Los Angeles. They're just, it's Gotham City, you know? Like, yeah. Yeah, that, that's what it feels sure. like in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And so uh, even me and Ashley just got in a big fight this weekend because we were down in L.A., mm -hmm. And, you know, our type what? of fight is different than a regular yeah, couple yeah, fight. Yeah. It's, like, it's like an intense ba mm -hmm. banter, you know. <laughs> but uh, but we get in this argument because this guy, like, literally, we're, we're in Los Angeles, like, in downtown L.A. on the, on the uh, 101. And this dude in this Nissan just, like, completely, like, dangerously cuts me off as we're mm -hmm. moving and almost gets me into a wreck and i'm like i in you know your intentional moments like i'm gonna honk but then i pull my hand back and i'm like i'm not honking mm -hmm. over here i'm not honking at someone i've mm -hmm. seen too many times right mm -hmm. now on the news mm -hmm. in la san bernardino sure. like mm -hmm. if you honk at someone if they're if they can stop like mm -hmm. they, 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 stop, they shoot you yeah. they mm -hmm. rob you they whatever right right, right. so <laughs> i'm like i go to honk and then i peel back and Ashley starts like questioning my manhood. <laughs> because like, you didn't honk. She didn't honk. I'm surprised she's she like, didn't reach yeah. over and honk for you. She's like, "Why didn't you lay on that break? He didn't, you know." And I said, "Baby, we, we're in a, we're in L.A. For right sure. now. Like, we're in a different side of town. This guy's in a Nissan. You know, people who drive Nissan. You know, <laughs> like Altimas and stuff. You know, oh. <laughs> you know they're up to no oh, good. Right. You know." <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when me and Erica met, she had an Altima. Uh -huh. <laughs> See wow. what I'm yep. saying? Makes sense. See yes. what I'm saying? <laughs> Bro, Nissan Altima is like, you, you just... <laughs> You know. <laughs> Your nickname's Creeper or something like that, you know? Like, <laughs> so this dude's dry, he's like, you know, almost runs me off in a Nissan Altima, right? So I, I pull back. He said, what are you doing? Get on that horn. I said, I said, hey, I ain't about to get shot over, over you know, honking my horn. Just, oh, yeah, oh, you're a punk. You're not going to get shot. You're that nothing sounds bad like Ashley happen, for sure. I'm like, nothing bad? I, and then I literally told her, I go, did you not see the video? Of the guy in his car off the 10 freeway who got literally ran off the road and mugged. Wow. And she was like, I didn't see that. That don't happen. That, that, that's in movies, you know. And I'm like, I have the video, Ashley. <laughs> I will pull over. I will show yeah. you the video. That, no, that don't happen. That's not real. Oh, so you just skipped everywhere you go. You're, wait, you're waiting to get robbed. I go... I go, yeah, as a man who's 250 pounds, who looks like he was once in a gang, even though I never was. <laughs> but you I, ain't fighting. <laughs> yeah. I said, maybe for a female, for you, Ashley, you could honk to a man and get away with it. He's not going to do nothing. I go, but to me, I honk at a guy. If he's for the streets, that's a, a I'm yeah. asking mm -hmm. for, for it. Sure. Yeah. For sure. She didn't compute. It yeah. just, it was, so we were for 40 minutes now in traffic we're just like pat you know like she's like i just think that's stupid i just think i just think you know he's the one in the wrong if you got to honk at him to let him run i was like listen you could do whatever you want when you're in the car driving but i seen too much stuff on the news yeah i do live in a, I, that's part of being a man i live in a constant state of mm -hmm. paranoia of something can go wrong at any sure. point that's part of the way god wired us so i told her no so we got in this huge thing and then i feel like towards the end of the day she came to and she's just like yeah, I'm glad you didn't, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, and then <laughs> she's like, I'm glad you didn't. And, you know, I just think that's crazy that, you know, that's what's happening right now. I go, well, that's, mm. that's, you don't get locked up for nothing nowadays. Right. And, and if you do, like, you're going to be out 90 days yeah. for some yes. of the, you know, there's a guy in another state who, um, uh, a guy in, I think, uh, uh, oh man, I forgot what state, but it, it also went viral too. Um, a, a girl was being mugged and two guys were robbing her at gunpoint and a guy who who comes out of a uh, the 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 gas station pulls out the gun and he shoots the two guys that were robbing the girl and now he's going to go to prison oh wow because he killed he, them yeah <laughs> it's in a it, in That's a very crazy. very you know liberal city like Los Angeles and mm -hmm. San Francisco it's in another state though and the <laughs> guys literally going to court to serve time right now because they said, oh, well, if she would have just given them what they asked for, no one's life would have been in jeopardy. 
That's oh, the court's God. argument. Oh, God. Wow. And yeah, so the is. guy who shoots, shoots, shot them both and I believe killed them, uh, he's now on court to do potentially 20 to 40 years oh, in God. prison. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. Because <laughs> like, oh, it had nothing to do with you. You weren't being mugged. It was not self-defense. And it's just, it's silly, right? Yeah. But if so, the same guy is just videotaping it, why didn't you didn't step in like and intervene? Right. Why didn't yes. you do something about it? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Let a girl get... So, yeah. suffice to say, tutu. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, it did happen back then. Um, m mostly, though, was over territory. Uh, people weren't robbing. It seemed like it was a little more degrees of respect back then. Yes, yes. So, yeah. robbing on the freeway, unless you were, like, big balling, yeah. no one was robbing like that. Not that. Yeah. Not, you know, watches and money. They were trying to get big money. Yeah. So, but yeah, um, that was me. So Ashley, I did what Ashley did last week <laughs> or this, <laughs> back in the day. And now it has changed. Like, yeah, like you could be tough and bad, but that has nothing to do with when someone pulls out a gun. For sure. And, yeah. you know, For sure. road rage is on a different level now. They, we didn't well, I heard of a guy in San Bernardino happened last year is, is um, the, uh, the guy got cut off. Uh, and so he honks on the guy and then he goes around the car mm -hmm. and then he brake checks him, brake checks the car who cut him off. Mm -hmm. And then they both come to a red light and then the guy Get pulls a gun out, mm -hmm. kills the guy who brake checked him and drove off. Yeah. In San Bernardino? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, that's 20 crazy. minutes away from us. I, okay. I was on the phone call with a private investigator yesterday. Because me and Erica are coming back from LA on the 10 East in between Mountain and Euclid. And we're in we're in bumper to bumper traffic. There's this guy, his neck is completely gashed. It looks like the walking dead. I've never seen anything like this. He's bloody. He gets in front of the car in front of us and just stops the car. So I'm like, what the heck is going on? Erica's driving. I'm in the passenger seat. Then he comes around to our car and just puts his hands on our on our hood. And I'm like, wait, what? Yeah. So this, this guy, happened when this this happened in 2021. What? But, but they're still what? But they're still investigating this because he ends up getting shot on the 10 freeway. You can look mm. it up. So 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 what ends up happening is. He puts his hands on the yeah, car. I think you're making up this story. No, right now. I'm, <laughs> I'm just look, kidding. Look, look it up. I'll show you. So, I love so, when people say look it up. I'm like, no, I believe you. Go, keep going. I've never, like, his, his neck is, like, completely gashed. Yeah. And so he stops, and he just looks at us, and we're, like, frozen. And then he just walks right past Erica, and I'm like, lock the door, lock the door, lock the door. She's like, I'm a nurse. I'm like... Lock the door. What right. car, now, what car all, were you in? Now, what all car? of a sudden, she's superwoman. <laughs> I think we had the Audi still. Mm. I think we were still in the Audi. And then he just walks by and keeps going. What ends up happening is um, he was he was in the car with his wife. He starts stabbing himself and then jumps out the car and starts walking on the wrong side of the freeway trying to harm people. And then the cops end up shooting him. So that's still being investigated now. That that literally, ha uh, I was on the phone with him yesterday, but that happened during COVID. Wow. Oh, my God. This is an upland. This is the 10, 10 East, Euclid and Mountain. Something about that Tim Freeway, huh? Well, yeah. Right? My lord. <laughs> well, my, because I, I was telling you this story, but my dad, he's, um, you know, used to run back in the day, run the streets hard, but yeah. he was just telling me, like, a recap of events, because I'm like, dad, what's the state of the streets right now? I was just like, the, oh, yeah, 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 yeah from jump, him. This is and, good wisdom. Yeah, and my no, dad. I don't know wisdom, but I mean, <laughs> just <laughs> awareness. Well, what? You know, <laughs> and my dad, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my dad was like crazy, crazy, but yeah. he was just telling me that the, the rules have changed. Like, there was a lot of, like, Pastor Chris was saying, a lot of sophistication in the way There's he a lot used of rules to run, and, and a lot of rules, yeah. and he goes, son. The streets are crazy right now. Like I don't even mess around. I'm like, and I've never even heard him talk like it's like, mm -hmm. what are you talking about? No, nah, no, nah, you don't even get it. Like it's crazy. People getting shot in the face. I'm like, wait, what? Like he's like, no, it's just there's no rhyme or reason. And he explained exactly yeah. the scenario. He goes, and it was just this crazy story. But pretty much, he's like, the streets are unlike I've never there's seen. There's no rules. Yeah. Young guys are no more crazy codes. and reckless. Mm -hmm. There's no yeah, code. There's no code. Go, you'll get killed mm -hmm. by a 16 year old mm -hmm. who don't even care. He's like, I don't even mess around no more. Mm -hmm. I don't even. It's crazy. And I'm like, oh shoot. And that was like a crazy quick story. My dad is like throwing grenades in kitchens. Like he was a war, <laughs> yeah. like a guerrilla warfare. Like yeah, yeah. And he's yeah. like it's for the just, for the military or 
Nah. <laughs> nah, for the, for no, for the streets. For his click. Hey, hey, but I don't know if you put me on this video. Yeah, I did. But there was a you, you did. <laughs> Your no, but there was a yeah, credit yeah, yeah, you did. There was a there was a video of a an ER doctor, an ER doctor, and they were just interviewing him, and they're like, "What's the what's the one thing with with all your years in the ER that you've learned? Like, what's some knowledge you have?" And he said, "I'll never honk my horn in the car." Yep. What? It's my new rule. Yeah, it's my, my da- new rule. Yeah, my dad's a firefighter, and so he goes on all these in LA city, and he goes on a lot of calls. So he knows I have like slight road rage. So whenever he hears I'm on the phone with him in the car, he hears me honk my horn. He gets livid. He said, "You can't do that. I don't care where you're at. People will shoot you, Chelsea." Because mm-hmm. he's gone on all those calls in LA where and like well, actually dead. like you think you think that's a joke, but it's like no, it's not. Seri- yeah, There's enough serious. cases now yeah. that like I legitimately. Like, I refuse to do it. Yeah. And if I do do it, it's because I did a pre course judgment. I'm like, that's a 90 year old person. Right? And they, yes. <laughs> they did it wrong. Right? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Well, this was Ultima. Ashley's argument like, oh, he's an Ultima and he's Mexican. So all of a sudden he's going to shoot you. I said, listen. Listen, I mean, <laughs> listen. Statistics are statistics. I'm Mexican, and I, you know, like, or and I consider, you know, like, or they don't care. Care. for the record, like, that's the first time I heard Adam say he's Mexican. I know, that's right? Yes. We've heard him say he's African American ten times. Listen, listen. No, he, t- listen. he took me to lunch when I got hired, 2016. We go to lunch. We're having sushi. He was like, "Yeah, man." As a black man, we gotta make sure that we're like, <laughs> we gotta look out for our community. <laughs> I was like, "What are you wait, 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 what?" <laughs> I remember a time I was at this pastor's gathering and I started talking about. It was assumed that most people knew that the church I came from and the history I have in the black community, but but like half the room didn't, and so. I started talking about, because now, like, for an hour, everyone's talking about, like, this is what the black community needs. This is what we need. So finally, I give my, <laughs> I give my, <laughs> I give my two cents, right, uh, which I believe was very good rationale on, on, <laughs> on what our communities need, you know. And now I just say, you know, people of color, minority community, because it kind of, many of the needs blur. But so one guy, you could tell he's getting, like, really fidgety that I have anything to say with a, anything about his community Mm -hmm. you know so you could tell he's kind of getting riled up and i'm not like criticizing him i'm just saying hey these are the issues we have blah blah blah. we have enough good men and this is you know all the men that are taking leadership and blah 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 bunch of stuff so you could tell he's he's wiring up so i hear this afterwards so another guy next to him who knows me he's kind of vocally whispering like man this guy is good who does he think he is is. blah 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 blah. so i'm done (laughs) and then he goes to speak up and then the other dude next to him taps him and he goes I want to go toe to toe with him. It, 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 his church has, is probably one of the largest black churches in America. You should probably you should probably not go toe to toe with him. That's like really. So the dude comes up to me afterwards. He was like, "Man, I was about to go off on you. I was getting so mad at what you were saying." And then they told me that you're African American, so we get. <laughs> yeah, man, I got I got my black card. I got my black card. Jesus help me. <laughs> <laughs> but in that case with Ashley, where she's telling me that I was stereotyping a Hispanic guy, I'm like, I am Hispanic, and now I can own that. You know, like, I, I can own that. I'm not like I'm not dumb. I'm, you know, like I'm not. But it's crazy. Yeah. It, 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 it's 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 it sad it's where we gone. Yeah. Well, you know, when Ashley was uh, pregnant with Thomas, she's at Target. And uh, she sees this young man just stealing everything in his backpack. He's just like, like putting stuff. He's like looking at her, and uh, she c- calls me after to tell me this. She's like, "Hey, so I saw this guy, this young man. He's stealing stuff. So I went and got the security guard, and they told me point him out. So then I, I, I walk at, you know, like I, I walk over to the corner where he was at, and I kind of, you know, succinctly point the guy out, and the guy they approach him, they search his bag." So then as I'm leaving, you know, the police has him in in handcuffs and he's just like staring at me. And then I'm like, and Ashley's like, and I'm like, haha, yeah, I got you. Okay. <laughs> and I'm like, I looked at her. I looked okay. at her and I said, that is the dumbest story I've ever heard in my life. I said, I said, they they could have unhandcuffed him and sent him away at any moment. He could have walked outside and saw what car you drive. He could have got in his car. He could have called somebody. I go, you had, oh, well, now you're just making up stories. I said, no. I said, Target does not need 
an Ashley police officer <laughs> for rich bitch crackers <laughs> and Cavassier, <laughs> whatever he was stealing. Like, they, they, we, I do not need, you know, like... <laughs> And even nowadays, if it's not over whatever $5,000 yeah. or whatever, like they can't even prosecute yeah. in California, mm-hmm. whatever the rule is. Yeah. So I'm telling her, like, so I looked at her and I go, You are to never, ever do is that again. Is she a fighter? Has she ever gone to fights? No, up? never in her life. But she's like a school safety officer. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, That's what she is. She likes snitching. And I told her, Just, just, just stop. <laughs> I, I get very noble. I'm very proud of you. Wow. You know, you looked out for Target. Oh, wow. I mean, they really needed that, you know, 50 bucks. But I told her, but at this case, this guy marked you. Like, he, you, you could in a year from now be walking in Rancho and this guy remember you. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, that's the girl who turned me in, right? You're not going to jail for stealing $200 worth of stuff at Target. Mm-hmm. So I just had to put her on game of like, this is how the justice system works. This is where, like, she's thinking, oh, he, but he's going to be gone for years. <laughs> like, <laughs> for some rich bits, crackers, <laughs> and some toothpaste. No, he's going to be yeah. back on the street tomorrow. Yes. Like they'll turn him away. That's petty theft. He, yeah. They'll say, our, our jails are too crowded. You can go. Yeah. Yeah, so... Wow. It's just okay. very, yeah, it's very, very, very disturbing and mm-hmm. obviously shows a need for the gospel, but, uh, and, but, uh, and also along with that shows need for community transformation. And I, yes. and sure. I think that we have to miss that. So for you, like, did you have any involvement in, were you a product of community transformation? Like what got you out of the space of the hood? Um, so my mom, <clears throat> my mom was a praying mother. Um, mm. My stepfather was a pastor um, oh. and yeah, me and even me and Pastor John go back. Our fathers um, were were four square guys. Yeah. Oh wow. Well, he then he started evangelizing. So he was oh, under okay. Bishop Blake. He oh, went to four yeah. square. He yeah. So, um, praying mother. Uh, so I stayed in L.A. End up getting my own place um, and started to continue to go to church with them because they would come from La Puente. And drive to LA, and since I lived in Inglewood, I would they would pick me up, oh, okay. and then I would go. Did you have to? Did they make you go, or no. you just decide? So no. what? At what point are your story when you were gang banging to then like I want I want to go to church? What? When was that pivotal moment, or was there a moment? That, there was a moment. That pivotal moment was during the riots. Um, the gang and the area that I was in. And so for uh, people don't know when you say the riots, what, what the are the riots? LA, uh, riots. The LA riots. Got a lot of, 19, we, got a lot of 19, yes, we got a lot of Gen Z who yes. listen too, so, so they may not know what you're talking about. <laughs> the LA riots, uh, it stemmed from um, Rodney King and the beating of Rodney King, some police, police officers. Brutality. brutality, yes, against uh, Rodney King. And f- the verdict came out and LA erupted um, mm-hmm. because... Uh, the police officers didn't got off scot free. Sure, yeah. And so um, during the riots and where I was living, um, there was a pawn shop in that area, and they wanted to get into the pawn shop. That was the one of the biggest pawn shops in um, you know in L.A. or in South Central, and they were like, "We need." Is this someone. Lawson? No, this is uh, Arlington and Jefferson. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so they well, were you like, don't want to give too, too much right? <laughs> We're like, hey, that was 20 she's years like, ago. She's like, I'm still in my She's like, I don't want to investigate her. She's like, I don't want to investigate an investigator like Aaron. <laughs> <to call me. laughs> Two years <laughs> later. <laughs> so they said, you know what? She's new. She's new to the crew. Let's use her and this and use this, uh, use her as um, like this a part of her initiation. So we need you. We need you to go into the pawn shop. Um, back in the day, they had those uh, gates that look like, you know, accordion, yeah, metal gates, metal yeah. gates mm-hmm. and then they'll have the, this big padlock. And so they were able to pry open one or two. And back then, I was so little and so skinny that I could fit through Anything. a door. That, yeah. yeah. And so they were like, I need you to go in. And so we, were, I was like, okay, um, and, and do what? And they, they had it mapped out. And you just need you to go here, go through this door, make a left, and I need you to go and open up the back door. Um, long story short, I end up going in, but prior to going in, we were standing out in the front talking. They had already, uh, busted out the windows with bricks, um, because the front of the pawn shop always had like glass windows so they can showcase like guitars yeah. and stuff like that. And so they busted those out and they were like, look, we're going to lift you up. You just go through there, go through the back. We need you to open up, um, the back door. That's all. That's what you know. That's, that's your con- contribution to this whole night. Yeah. You just need to open up. 
And so I was like, okay. And I remember as it yesterday, like I had steel toe boots on, I had black on, I had, um, you know, long sleeve shirts on and they lifted me up. I lifted up on the platform and right when I um, jumped down off of the platform onto the floor, um, I heard um, what sounded like the cocking of a shotgun. And, um, and then I felt um, this pressure on the back of my head, which was the back of or the barrel of the shotgun. And the, the guy said this. He said, go back and tell them we're in here. This is at night. Lights oh are gosh. off because during the riots, all power yeah. went out, all of that. And so um, during that time, I think I, I was so frightened and so mm -hmm. scared. I urinated on myself, and and I'm like, oh, my God, how am I going to get back on this platform? I got up, and I'm, I'm trying to get out of the gate, and I have to get out by myself. So I scratched the side. It was a Ooh. huge scratch. And I came out, and they're looking at me like, Yo, what you doing? And I'm like, they in there. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> and and so I went home, um, and it was dark, and I laid in my bed and I cried in my grandmother's house. And from that point on, I was like, I can't, I can't do that. Like, yeah, I, I looked at death so many times from the time I moved there until then. I was like, how many more chances am I gonna get? Yeah. And yeah. I knew that it was because of the prayers of my mother, but. I was like, I'm going to church because the only person that can help me right now and mm. it is him, is God. And so I, I start going back to church. Um, my stepfather, who was the one who was the evangelist and the pastor, um, he did a lot of prison ministry. Um, the last place that he went to evangelize and go on the mission field was Papua New Guinea. And he would come back and he would give us like the money and he would, he, he would always say like, uh, you're going you're gonna to go. And I used to look at him and say, that, that's not for me. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing what you're doing. He would go into the L.A. Um, jails. He would go into Chino Hills, um, and he would travel. And there was one time that there was this service at church, and we had some pastors there, including um, my dad, and he was preaching. And he called us up, and he, he basically prayed over us, but then there was someone that prophesied over us. Um, and basically told us what they what they felt that the Holy Spirit was telling them. And my dad said, you're going to be a missionary. And I was like, no, I ain't. <laughs> That's what I'm not going to be. And now I never knew that I would do what he, he yeah, I, yeah. I ran from it for years. Um, so that was pivotal. And then once, once I got on the mission field, I remember doing a mission trip here. At Abundant Living, you guys, uh, Abundant Living was at the Utica property. I was going to church in L.A., but they were offering a, a trip to Africa. Um, so I have gone, I went on like two trips before that and then came here and went to Africa um, with Abundant Living. The second trip to Africa, um, which was a year later, I end up being, um, getting sick. I end up catching malaria in oh, Africa. Man. And I was in my hotel room. I had IVs connected to me. I felt like I was going to die. Um, I was hearing things. A fly could land on the curtain, and I heard the fly land. It was crazy. And, and, and I, yeah, I was just so sick. Couldn't hold anything down. And I remember hearing a voice that said, if you don't follow me and you don't answer the call on your life, I'm going to show you your replacement. And at that moment, of course, you hear something like that. You're like, oh, my God, he's going to kill me dead. God, don't kill yeah. me, Lord. Don't kill me here in, in yeah. Africa. Um, and that, from that point on, I was like, okay, what, what is it that you want me to do? And he was like, this, I'm calling you to the nations. I'm calling you to, um, to evangelize. I'm calling you to, to make me known in, in other places. Um, and so my prayer from that point on was, God, just keep in front of me what you pulled me out of. Yeah. So when I go to these places, whether it be locally, whether it be abroad, that that is always before me, that I don't get too high or too mighty and forget where you pulled me out. Let me meet everybody that comes to me. Let me meet them where they are. And so the, after that, my ministry um, in LA was going down to Skid Row. Hmm. 
um, I would sit, people would be like, why are you sitting on this nasty ground that has <laughs> urinate, uh, they yeah. urinated in feces? And I was like, because God reminded me what he pulled me out of. And so from that point on, it's just, that's what I've been doing. Wow. Um, and yeah, so that was pivotal for me at yeah. that point. Yeah. yeah. So what, like, uh, now that you've been doing uh, missions with us and lead all of our missions trip and stuff like that, uh, also our local outreach. But what is your, do you have, what is your craziest missions story? Do you have one? Any one that deals with either satanic oppression? Because you've done like Haiti and stuff like the huge witchcraft mm-hmm. um, uh, movement in Haiti yeah. and stuff like that. Or just incredible story. Like, you know. One of each. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I yeah, do. Yeah, and yeah, I do yeah, have yeah. one of each. So yeah. I, I will tell you um, one from Haiti. Um, so prior to coming to a, a Abundant, I had my own nonprofit called Young Visionaries, and it was a it was a mentorship program where I mentored kids in foster youth and at risk kids from like Jordan Downs and the jungles and all of that, and I showed them the importance of service. I kept saying, God, I need to take them into other environments because this is all that they see. Mm-hmm. There was kids in the foster care system that didn't see, you know, the mountains ever been to the mountains or been to the ocean. Right. And so, um, with that, um, I didn't lost my train of thought. That's, that's an old timers moment right there. <laughs> Haiti. You are, oh, okay. Haiti. So you are Haiti. a grandmother. Yeah, I so am. A grandmother get, too. You get a no, I'm a GG. Yeah, I'm, I'm a GG. Yeah, yeah. And then, See, I'm just giving um, her a yeah, window so of opportunity. You. Yeah, you can you. claim, <laughs> you know, you claim, you know, it's grandmothers. We. It was a young timers <laughs> moment. <laughs> um, so fast forward. Um, I uh, going to Haiti. The there was um, a trip that we had and. We would go out into the the bush area of Haiti, and we would evangelize, kind of like door to door. And so we had our interpreters. The interpreters will ask those that are in those areas, hey, we have a team from um, California. Is there anything that you want us to pray for? And before, in our prep, I always tell individuals, like, when you're going out, um, don't touch, don't, you know, if someone wants to give you something, don't receive it. Say thank you, um, but no thank you. You know, um, be respectful, be kind. Uh, but one of the biggest rules is just do not touch, right? Yeah. And so um, we're, we're in front of a house, and there's these two girls. One is braiding the other girl's hair. And this was a huge team. I think this team that I'm referring to had about 32 people. And um, there was a, the, one of the girls said, I don't want prayer. My dad is is a is a witch, and we were like a witch. Yeah, he's a voodoo priest. We was like, oh, okay. The other girl who was getting her hair braided said, "No, pray for me. Pray for me for that." Just what he said. <laughs> <laughs> pray for me. And so one of the leaders, uh, I believe at that time it was Don Osborne. He started to pray, and all of a sudden we I I pray with my eyes open. Pastor Kenny said, mm-hmm. "Pray with your eyes open." Right. So I'm praying and just observing. I see movement in this huge tree. And in a, in a matter of a nanosecond, the man that was at the top of the tree was at the trunk of the tree. I don't know how he got down that quick. And so in the middle of the prayer, the girl says, that's my dad. We were like, oh, okay. So, uh, uh, okay. So he finishes the prayer. One of the team members goes over and says to him and puts her hand on his oh, um, no. shoulder and says, can I pray for you? And he pushed it off and says, no, I don't need you to pray for me. Turns back around, climbs back up in the tree, like, like quickly. Like, it was, it was yeah. freaky. Um, later, that, later that night, that one individual was acting very strange, uh, very disrespectful, um, the daughter or the girl being the braided? Gir- the the, girl, that for the, the girl that t- oh, the team member yeah. that put her hand on. Yes, and no, no. Um, long story yes, short, no, no. long story short, um, I sent all of our young adult or young um, teenagers to, to their room to go to sleep. And um, I asked the adults um, on the trip to stay. We're going to pray for, for today. We're going to pray for tomorrow. Um, and so we're praying. And that one person that touched... Um, all of a sudden, 
she was trying to jump over the banister and we're like two stories high. So it was me and four other people that were trying to hold her from jumping over the banister. Um, long story short, there was we we were we were praying trying to cast this thing out cuz she was talking you heard it you heard like the demonic forces in yeah. Uh, yeah and there were some people up there that was like what is going on here and um we just continue to pray um for her L- long story short um she sat down and she was like i was fighting for my life yeah I, 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 y'all didn't hear me. You didn't hear me scream, and I, we didn't hear you scream. Um, so that happened. Um, we went to Ethiopia, and we did a, a service in Ethiopia. And uh, the pastor said, "There's a lot of demonic forces here, um, and there's a lot of, of the individuals that have been um, that have been possessed with a spirit." And all of a sudden, the back door opens, and there's a guy that crawls in there on all fours. His his um, his torso is flat. He looked like a spider, and his head was flipped up. And right, he's walking through. You're and in the room. All, all my entire oh team my is in the room. Yeah. And <laughs> Pastor he's, face. he's walking. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> yeah. He's walking and yeah. um, towards us. And we have a member here, and she was like, in the name of Jesus, come out, right? And the guy was, so we've had those types of encounters. That's why every mission trip isn't for everybody. Wait, finish the story. What what happens? um, So, so, (laughs) so we we continue to pray. The, the, The one team member that I'm speaking of was like, in the name of Jesus, come out. Um, you have no authority here. You have no authority over him. And when I tell, I've never seen, I, I, I've seen contortionists. I've seen, um, I've seen O in, in uh, Las Vegas. Yeah, yeah, Nothing yeah. compared to what I've seen on how his entire body was just, yeah. yeah. Um, so he moaned, he groaned, he foamed. He did all of that. And then all of a sudden he dropped and he sat up like a regular person, like I'm sitting up right now. Um, it, it took a little while longer, um, that we still had to pray. We still had to cast out the other people in the room that was from that particular church. All you heard was them just speaking in tongues and saying like, apparently this person has been coming there for a while. Um, so I believe he was delivered because he was able to walk out. He, he was wailing. He, he, he said, he was wail. He said, you don't understand how long. People were saying, you don't understand how long he's been like this. Oh, my gosh. Um, yeah. Uh, it, it, yeah. So that was what happened. He was delivered yeah. um, when we left. Wow. Um, I've seen where we, some some individuals have big goiters. Mm. And we lay our hands. And as we're laying hands and praying, the goiter is, is shrinking. Um, their faith, though. Yeah. Well, pe- yeah, people, well, people often ask, and I think, I think there's two, two elements that go with the issue of, you know, miraculous mm-hmm. aspects in America and why it doesn't happen is because we, we, we currently, you know, we, we live in this kind of post-Christian, it's becoming, it's not yet, Europe is, like England and other places, but we li- we're coming to a post-Christian era, and even for the past hundred years, and really since the Enlightenment era, you know, we we rationale everything in mm-hmm. the in the Americas. We we are part of Western society where there's always a medication that can solve something. Sure. There's always a therapy that can solve something. So um, d- d- demons are good with disguising, and so that's what they want. They don't mm-hmm. want to be casted out. They don't mm-hmm. want they to don't, be healed. Right. Now now they'll ex- begin to expose themselves as a way to fear you. Mm-hmm. To get you you know they don't know where your Christian faith mm-hmm. is. So 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 their goal is by you know, in these, in these countries that, um, don't have so much where everything is rationale and sure. everything, you know, we, we, we label everything a mental health problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, oh, that's a mental health. Yeah. You know, some, some stuff is, is demonic. And mm-hmm. my friend who has the podcast exorcist files, he does a great job at synopsing, you know, the way that the exorcist experts in the Catholic church do is they go, you know, we, we do a set standard amount of interviews. The interviews decide whether a person needs therapy and then the last resort is exorcism, exorcism. right? Mm-hmm. So, 
but they at least have an understanding to say, yes, therapy is appropriate for some things, but then there's other things that have to be casted out. Mm -hmm. For the most part, I even know probably half of the pastors I know believe that everything could be solved with therapy, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, where, and I just was talking to an individual where they're telling me they're like waking up every day, vomiting and all this stuff like that. And and they, they're hearing voices and stuff. And so I was very honest with them. I said, Hey, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to, you know, connect you with our team and we're going to decide together whether you are dealing with oppression Mm -hmm. that needs to be casted out or you need to come or possession, or you need to come to a reality of who God is. And it is a mental fight that you're fighting. Sure. Um, it's, it's more of in yourself, it's Mm -hmm. your trauma or whatever. And then that we can minister to according to the word of God, if that is what's causing you upset, because we can make ourselves vomit. Mm -hmm. We can make ourselves be angry and lash out emotionally, or the demonic can have that effect. But the reason why I think that we see the expressions that we see in outside countries, you know, like in South America and in Mm -hmm. Asia and in Africa is because for us, we're kind of too smart for our own good. Mm -hmm. And for demons, they can hide in that really easily Mm -hmm. and just say, Oh, you, you know, you have bipolarism, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like, well, that is a real clinical, uh, uh, issue, but like a person could actually also be possessed and be bipolar from the the demon, you know, the effects, but we just immediately, so the demon gets to settle in real nice into, and just get medicated or just get therapied or counseled Mm -hmm. rather than, you know, choosing freedom from this demon. And I always highly encourage people to listen to Mm -hmm. the exorcist files, because I I think it gives a, a really beautiful picture of like how you have to choose freedom and how the authority of Christ can break that free. But number one, yeah. the person has to choose it. Yes. And number two, the person exercising the authority has to have enough authority and enough expertise. Like not, that's not for everyone. Even mm-hmm. Jesus said that like this demon yeah, yeah. here will only come out with prayer and fasting. Mm-hmm. In other words, like your spiritual authority tank is too low to be able to go toe to toe with yep. this creature that has yes. existed, you know, at the beginning of dawn of creation. Mm-hmm. Right. So, I think that when you go to these other countries, you see more and more of the exhibitions because that excuse of, oh, well, I'm just bipolar or I'm just, that don't work in Haiti. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. doesn't work in Ethiopia. Mm-hmm. There's, they don't have no framework of that level of mental health. And so, yes, you know, there are some Salem rich trial stuff where in some of those countries people get, you know, either locked up or put away because all they need is just some good counseling or therapy but there's also a real reality where the demonic will expose itself more as as a way to you know to 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 try to scare everyone Mm -hmm. off like you have in the scriptures the madman of Gadara, and he's running Mm -hmm. around and he's like scratching himself and he's in the rocks and Mm -hmm. he's chained and he's all that because that's the way the demon gets everyone away so that the demon can settle in when america if someone if that happened we'd go oh that's a demon that should be casted out you know, like that we, so then they don't tend to do, do that, that right. in America, yeah. Yeah. but they'll do that in those countries. Cause in those countries they do say, Oh, that could be a demon or whatever, or they're just sick in the head and they've lost their mind. So just leave them alone in society. There's not enough care, nor do they have the authority or knowledge mm-hmm. to, to, to cast those things out. Right. So I, you know, cause people always hear these stories and they go, well, it's phony. It's not true because that doesn't happen in my neighborhood. And it's like, well, you're in America. There's a reason for it. Yeah. Very mm-hmm. different. And oh, how come those healings don't work in America? Well, because in America, we go to a doctor, we go, and I'm not mm-hmm. saying that's the move, but our faith doesn't match yes. what the faith, because those countries, they don't have doctors. They do. Yeah. You know, they may have some type of, you know, physician, but not that they don't have the great physician. And so you need miraculous healing in those countries. You know, that there's a reason why missions organizations that doctors that come to those countries and just help with teeth and mm-hmm. help with other aspects of their life because they it's not readily accessible and available to whereas in America, you know. We don't exercise faith. We exercise Kaiser Permanente. Medicine. You yeah. know? Right, right, right. I had a friend from, from Egypt that I met 
And uh, she was an atheist. Her whole family is still currently atheist. And the part of Egypt she lived in, like, if you, if you utter the name of Jesus, you're, you're getting killed. That's mm-hmm. the area she lived in. So uh, she said that she had an encounter with God where, he, where she felt like he appeared in her room. And so she felt led to, let me go to the That state. Jesus appeared to her room. Yes, she felt yeah, like. super yes. fa- famous in Egypt. That yes. That's what Jesus does there. Absolutely. It's crazy. So she, she moves to the States to get a, a, a biblical education, and she didn't want her family to know. So she, she, she moved out here, told them that it was for studies, like that were not religious, but she was really getting her degree at the college yeah. I used to go to. So her and I were talking. I went out to, to coffee with her, and I said, what did you feel? What's the difference between what's happening in Egypt uh, spiritually versus here? She said, when I came to the States, it feels like there's a, a demonic blanket that is wrapped around you guys, and you don't even feel it. You feel comfort, and you don't know it's demonic. That's what she feels spiritually. She said, Chelsea, in Egypt, uh, God shows up in a different way because we don't have the resources that you guys do in America. So he show, he's showing up in rooms, and he's making it very clear to where you know that there's a God. So now that she's out here in California, she's like, she's the most spiritual person. And I said, why is it? How did you go from being an atheist to a full-on believer? She said, because I know... Y'all think it's medicine that's going to fix you, but mm-hmm. it's really way more spiritual than you realize it is because yeah. their first resort in Egypt, if you are a believer, is to resort to uh, we need God, not not a doctor, not medicine. And so she she just show, said, hey, California, y'all are comforted by a blanket that's so demonic and you don't even feel it. And I'm like, oh, Lord, Jesus, is that me? Help me. Don't <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Save me. Help me <laughs> I don't want that to be me. Yeah, it's wild. They yeah. God shows up different in other countries. And I think it's a faith thing. Um, I think there's a lot. Yeah. And I, and I think there's a mass amount of truth in there and it's interesting because you could look at different spaces and places and you can see you know this is how the lord tends to work in haiti Mm -hmm. this is how the lord tends to work in ethiopia this is how the lord tends to work in america right um and 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 i believe he does operate uh many times distinctively different but to get to the end result right Mm -hmm. which is salvation and freedom and deliverance but it very much is different but a lot of times i think i think we add to our own disadvantage with our acceptance of things that would exist. The amount of times that I've talked to people that just go like, this is my problem. I just have an anger issue. And it's like, what? Like Mm -hmm. you just accept that, you know, and you're just, you're just, eh, or I'm a medication that helps with it. And I'm not, I'm not, and I'm not, I'm not saying medication isn't appropriate and we are blessed with the type of medical uh, access we have in our country, but that, that can also be an Achilles heel. Mm -hmm. I knew one of my best friends I had with Cairo who his father's story, because his father was a very famous Christian evangelist from Egypt, and his father's story was he was Muslim. He had a family, had a wife in in Islam in Egypt. And the way it works in Egypt is if you're born a Christian, you're allowed to be a Christian. And even kids have tattoos with crosses on their hands. And, we, and when I was a youth pastor, I had a, a, one of my students was from Egypt, and he was like, 13 years old and he had a tattoo of a cross and it got tattooed on him when he was younger in Egypt. And that basically identified you allowed to be Christian in Egypt because you were born into it. So if you're born into it family wise, just like it is in Palestine nowadays, like you can familiar bonds, it's passed down. And so you could do that, but you could can't convert to Christianity. That's not allowed in Egypt. Um, Not really governmentally, but obviously societal pressure Mm -hmm. doesn't allow that. So, he was born, Cairo, my friend's dad, he's now gone home to be with the Lord, uh, his dad, but he was Muslim. He had a family. He was like in his thirties or forties. He's, he's asleep one night and he says, Jesus comes to him. And because he had a great hate, uh, against Christians, against the gospel, but very much like, you know, Saul to Paul was. And so he says, uh, and he would, you know, which is very common. Our friend Jimmy, who's here, who he's Egyptian, he, his family's Christian. He has a lot of stories where, like, they would build a church and Muslims would come and they would burn the church down. And there's a big, yes. it's gang stuff, you yes. know, like mm-hmm. not Bloods and Crips. It's Christians and Muslims <laughs> yes. in some of these countries, mm-hmm. right? So they do everything to hinder each other. Um, and so, well, m- yeah. mostly Muslims, you yeah. know, are attacking Christianity because it's mostly Muslim uh, population. So he basically would do stuff like that. Like he would go and hinder the church and his local church in his city. He like burnt it down and all these things like that. So he says, he's sleeping one night. Jesus appears to him in his dream. And he says, uh, why have you been persecuting me and my church? Don't do that. 
Hmm. Uh, and he says, I am the Lamb of God. Hmm. I am truly who I am. You need to receive me and, and, and you need to accept my death and my resurrection in your life. And he says in the dream, he says, yes, I will. I do receive you, Jesus. And he says at that moment, Jesus takes uh, wine and he says, then in the dream, he says, I'm going to lead you in your first communion. And he explains to him, this is my blood that was shed for you. This is my body that was broken for you. And in the dream, he gives him a drink of wine and then he drinks the wine and then he brings out a, uh, a piece of pita bread and then he gives him the pita bread to represent his body. And then he wakes up from his dream and he has a hot, warm pita bread in his mouth that he pulls out of his mouth. Wild. And just completely, wow. radically gives his life to Christ. He wakes his wife up, says, Jesus just appeared to me in a dream. I just took communion with him. She thinks he's crazy. Mm -hmm. The next day she turns him into the local authorities which is like not the police, but like the religious leaders and stuff like that. My husband's crazy. He says he's following Jesus. Da, da, da. So they come to kill him mm. and he leaves mm. and he basically goes somewhere else for a period of time. And then he gets a visa and then he comes to America. And so now when he joins a church, uh, um, I think in New York or something like that, he ends up meeting Cairo's mother because his, he lost everything. Lost his children. His kids told him they hated him. Mm -hmm. His kids told him, we don't like, we wish you would die. And so he leaves, he flees, he loses his family, he loses his wife. And then he comes to America and then he restarts and wow. he becomes an evangelist, particularly to Muslims wow. to preach the gospel. And, and his dad was very well known and led this big movement of Egyptian Christians, converts in particular, and was very well known for that. But his story was a very famous story because apparently that is something Jesus loves to do in Egypt, which is to appear, appear wow. in people's dreams. Yes. And then because otherwise they wouldn't hear, you know, yes. um, in their in their communities. They know of him, but they never get told the gospel. You know, they, he's more villainized than anything. So, yeah. I didn't so, know that story. That's oh, wild. Yeah. yeah. So, it, you know, his dad since has gone home to be with the Lord. But that so I say all that to say it's interesting how. In, uh, in in different spaces, like you needed a shotgun <laughs> mm -hmm. to the back of your head that, that woke you up, and then you have these other countries, you know, it approaches the gospel, though very clear, comes in many different forms that lead us exactly to where we need to be, you know? Yeah. I think yeah. this, for my personality, points to the need for discipleship, because if there's young people giving their life to the Lord, we're talking about all these global expressions of Jesus, so if I go on TikTok and I'm a Christian and I see deliverance in Africa, yeah. I'm like, this is wild. Mm -hmm. But if I like Christian hip hop, I'm looking on TikTok. Here's how you deconstruct. If I look at church conferences with white churches, all you need is systems. So then, yeah. so yeah. then, like, if you're, if you're yeah. not being if you're yeah. not being discipled and you're not growing mature, you wouldn't have this type of understanding, mm -hmm. nor would you have a humility to accept something that you don't understand. understand. But, yeah. yeah. So it's like. We, so for that person that gets delivered, for the community to know how long that he's been in that condition, prayerfully, they can still walk with that individual sure. because mm -hmm. the community needs to help us like to like receive things that we don't initially understand. Because the way that we're wired is like the first time something comes to us, we don't understand. We tend to reject it. Yeah. And that's yeah. why it's like, oh, OK, maybe that's not a spirit that maybe that's that is just mental health. Maybe that's depression. And that's what everybody's saying. So now we're going to accept that. But now that we're so global just from our phones, we need to be more aware and we need to be humble enough that Jesus can appear how he wants to, how he chooses to, when and where and how. But then once he does so, it's on us to be a part of communities where we can mature. Yeah. That, that kind of yeah. answers a question that I had that I was going to pose to you, Pastor LaGreese, because every time she's about to go on a mission trip here for the church, I hear she's having meetings that she's spiritually prepping people mm -mm. To, to know. I've like, been in those meetings. Yes. Yeah. So I always <laughs> find it so fascinating. She's like, you better guard your gates, guard your yeah. gates. She always yeah. preaches that to people who go on missions trips. So you're aware that there's a type of spiritual awareness that you need to have when you're going to these foreign countries. But you talk about how out here there's tons of pastors who think 
think that therapy is going to solve all, all of the all of the problems that we have. So my question is, how do and how does any pastor or leader get to a point where they have an awareness of what is uh, natural or supernatural, uh, demonic or, or or not? How do we have? How do we come to a better awareness to decipher uh, the sickness in which people really do have? Mm-hmm. I don't know if that question made sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, it's a great <laughs> yeah. question. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you have some? Um, yeah. Well, so in our our spiritual preparation, you know, we we for for mission teams, we talk about the full armor, but we also talk about like hearing God's voice. Like we need you to be so in your word and and so prayed up that you're able to hear a whisper from God because he will direct you. He will tell you. He will say, I need you to guard your gates right now. This person is about to walk in and he'll tell you, he'll, he'll give you what you need for that. I think, um, for, for the mission field, he always, um, he always reveals, um, what is in front of me or what's, what's about to come. Cause every preparation is different depending on which country we're going to spiritual warfare could be different in, you know, Haiti versus, yeah. you know, um, Ethiopia. And so I always, I, t- I tell them when I say guard your gates is I need you to, from this point on, um, to turn off the things that you're listening to, to watch what you say, watch what you see. Um, because those are the, those are the gates that God is going to use to reveal what's in front of you to reveal if it's, um, if it's something natural or supernatural to reveal if it's something demonic or not. And so you have to be in tune with him for him to show you. Yep. If not, then your lens is going to be on you and be like, oh yeah, he, he's, that's what that is. And you, you'll make the wrong diagnoses yep. and they'll end up, um, living the way that they're living and, or walk out of the room when you could have if you would have listened to what he said, he would have he would have given given you the answer to know. Let's pray and let's cast this out, and or let's let's love on him. Let's pray and then let's talk and see if we can you know find out if there's more to this. But yeah. it's really the spiritual preparation is for you to allow God to show you. Yeah. Yep. And yeah. Have discernment. Yeah. And I think a very practical you know kind of comparison is like let, let's say let's say I, i'm an individual and for the past 20 years you know you watch pornography every single day for the last 20 years and then you're married and then you're having all these intimacy intimacy issues with your spouse that person may come to us and say hey we have a spirit that's oppressing us me and my wife are struggling with our intimacy how can we have freedom from that demon or that oppression. Cause that's what I think it is. And it's like, no, you watch pornography for the past 20 years. You have built a habitual sin life. Mm. Satan is not always the enemy. Correct. You yourself, your flesh yeah. is the enemy. Yeah. And so you need freedom and counseling that is going to help you. And I think there are some secular counseling that can help with certain things. And then I think there are some things that only biblical counseling can help solve. And in this particular case, I would say, yeah, there's natural things you could do in a secular sense and you could stop watching it and put in systems, but you also need to have a new healing perspective and freedom in that. And that is still a form of deliverance, but you Mm -hmm. are being delivered from your sin. You're being delivered from yourself. And so I think more commonly we want to wrap everything in a bow and blame everything on something else. And so it's very easy to give an excuse to say, well, that it's a spirit or it's oppression or, Mm -hmm. you know, I hear it all the time. Parents come and they say, I think a spirit's on my daughter or my son. And I'm like, no, I think you have a kid that maybe you didn't discipline. You know, I think maybe you have a child, you know, it's like, it's like, well, there's a lot of reasons on why your child could be where it is. Maybe there's oppression. That's why I always go, maybe, but, but let's first dialogue about you. What was the circumstance to get, you know, like there was no rules at home, no curfews, no this, no that. Well, you're not dealing with a child that's oppressed. You're dealing with a child that you didn't have healthy boundaries that you Absolutely. raised that is now doing whatever they want. And so can spiritually something be involved in that? Yes. Obviously everything that has some type of sin nature and we are part spirit, So it's like, yeah, okay, that could be spiritual, but in the particular sense of, am I being, am I being toyed with by a demon or by Satan? 
like I think that percentage is far smaller than we think. A lot of it could be some type of oppression, whereas like maybe some spirit didn't like the woman in your case where he touched his shoulder and now there's some type of oppression. She's not possessed, but there's an oppression of mind and thought Mm -hmm. and, and, and her like, should I hurt myself or anything like that? But the actual, like I am possessed, like you're Mm -hmm. dealing with, cause, cause I believe, and you got to go into extra biblical theological stuff. Like I believe a person to be possessed has to be willing to be possessed that it's not forced upon. And so there's some type of gate at some point that you have accepted that now you may not have said, Oh, I received that demon, but you have either uh, engaged with the occult. Yeah. You've engaged with witchcraft. Yes. You have, you have uh, committed a grievous sin against God's creation in some type of way that has basically said, I'm no longer, I'm no longer associated with God's creation. I want to associate with the powers of the demonic. I think that is when possession really takes place. And I've seen it before. I've told mm-hmm. stories here before. Guy told me he wanted to kill me once and all that. Mm-hmm. That was possession. Then there's, you know, then there's oppression. But a, so I think the way that I would, if when I'm talking to someone, I'm deciding is first, I want to talk about like, what is it that's hindering you? Why do you want to have a conversation? What's going on? Because someone that's possessed, um, sometimes most of the time they don't want help. So it's someone else trying to get help Mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, someone who's possessed isn't necessarily true unless they have a moment of sobriety and then they're like, Oh, I got to go find a religious leader or something like that. But I, but I have to think most of the time that stuff comes from a family member, a loved one, which Mm -hmm. we have seen many times. I remember one time when I was a young children's pastor, I walked by our offices and I saw three of our pastors being held up in the air by a nine year old, you know, in the church Mm -hmm. office, like by their chest and their neck. And, and they, you know, trying to pray and cast out this not traumatized a demon, you, you know, I was like, whoa, okay. <laughs> you know, like, dang. But you have OGs like Pastor Kenny who just comes and right. he tells you how it was. And, you know, like this is what you do and this is what you learn from it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you don't have the authority to cast out that demon, you shouldn't be in the room, in the you room. know, like, yes. and, and two of, two of the pastors got scared and they timid and they backed off and the demon saw that made a move and, the other uh, more senior person, which I think might have been Pastor Kenny or someone, you know, stepped in and, and, and handled it over time. But but um, so, yeah, I mean, I think to your thought is like we should take it much more serious than we do. But we also should be aware that not everything is that there yeah. are many things mm-hmm. that, you know, you, you, you talk about maybe in another country, a child who was on the streets, who didn't have a father, had to go and do whatever they wanted to do, crime or whatever, to try to make buy, rob, steal, whatever. Like, you know, you can't assume like, oh, because he's that way and he's 19 and he's Mm -hmm. hurt people and blah, blah, there's a demon attached to it. It's also like, there's also community and culture that's Mm -hmm. around that, that, that which still gives the beauty of the church because the church can minister to all types of man, the outer man and the inner man, The, 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 the gospel can you know, the gospel can give freedom to someone who is being controlled by a demon, but the gospel can also give freedom to someone who is spiritually ill Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from their own sin, Mm -hmm. you know, like, and we would say across the board, those are all deliverance. Unfortunately in America, we've gotten this deliverance. uh, Many Christian circles have gotten these deliverance, you know, they're deliverance hunters and they're demon hunters and they're just looking for the expressions and they're trying to make that look sexy online. But But deliverance to me is the person that says, like, yes, Jesus, I receive you as Lord and Savior. You've mm-hmm. died and resurrected for me like that. Like, that's the most beautiful deliverance someone yeah. could ever get. Not the fact that someone vomited and they're laying on the ground now. Right. And they're like, yeah. oh, I can sleep now. Like, mm-hmm. that's great. But let's make Christ your Savior. Yes. Like, that is the greatest rest you can you can find. And I feel like that doesn't necessarily get emphasized enough. enough mm-hmm. to not in individuals, but in the, in like our American, in the mm-hmm. subculture Christianity, yeah. it's like, you know, it's, it's the, it's the, it's those, and it always looks the same, you know? Um, and I, and I'm not dodging on it. I'm just saying you go to other countries and you see demons exercise in certain ways. And then in America, you don't see it yeah. that way too much. And sometimes I think, you know, that person has identified to be a Christian for six years and they're being, you know, a demon casted out of them. Like I, I think they're, mirroring what their environment a lot of times has expressed I think, to them. I think what will look more potent for that person that's already a Christian, but let's say they're getting counsel, that person that's been on, addicted to porn for 20 years. 
another picture of deliverance is confession of that sin mm -hmm. and then putting um, guarding your gates. All right, I've deleted Instagram. I've deleted TikTok. I have an accountability group. Hey, it's been three weeks since I haven't watched porn. Okay, great. It's been six months. Okay, that's great. It's because it takes spiritual warfare to fight off the temptation. Yeah. So if you have 20 years of bad habits, but you have that confession, you're still loved as a part of a community, then you can unlearn those things. And I think that's more potent than like a moment of somebody shivering on stage or whatever, mm -hmm. because I'm always curious on what happens after the service. Mm -hmm. What happens? What conversations and I are they having? I rarely yeah. see that. The I testimonials rarely see someone who went through that, yeah. and then you see them, and that could exist, and I just may be naive, but it, I, re, I, I mostly see the, the it, it reminds me of a Las Vegas show. I see the person doing the show, which it may not be a show, it may be legitimate, but I'm like, why can't I see them two years after in their faith, in their walk, in their, you know, it's like, it's rarely told, which then goes to me, it does. It makes me question the integrity of the spiritual leader to say, hey, what you're doing may be legitimate, but why is your not, why is your ministry not the full gospel where now you show them what you did deliverance, but where what do does discipleship look church? like? Yeah, right. where, where are they at in the body of Christ? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then, and then I've seen a lot of times, because I have gone to churches like that before. I've, I've gone to churches that really heavy, heavily lean that way. And then maybe I've been a speaker at their church before, and I come back two years later. That same person that got delivered two years ago comes back again yeah. and does the same thing. And then I always go, man, I saw this person two years ago, and I think they come every week. At what point is a pastor going to pull this person aside? And say, listen, yeah. de deliverance, if you read the Gospels, deliverance happens once. Yeah. And, you know, then you move into freedom and now you move into discipleship. Like yeah. the fact that you're being delivered six times a year may show it may not be a demon. <laughs> yeah. You may have just found an excuse for your sin. And then you go, you, you have a freedom night and then you go back to the drug of choice in the next three months. And then you go, there's that demon again. It's like, no, there's your sin again. Correct. Get your butt in yeah. church. Yes. Mm -hmm. Get your butt in a community, be held accountable. Yes. And, and to the pastor, stop preaching. Everything is the enemy. Tell them, it's your habits, you know, it's your, your decisions, sin, your habits, your decisions, a great part to deal with it. And if you are possessed, it started with your habits and your decisions and what you've allowed. And so therefore start teaching about the responsibility for them to read their word, know their word, be engaged in the gospel, be engaged in the community, the church. Like that is just the start point. And I just feel like not enough of them when I'm at those spaces are sharing that, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, it's a, it's a limited message. I think some churches... I don't think it's their intention at all, but like has the same marketing strategy of hitting the lottery because like the lottery doesn't show five years from now. Here's their <laughs> continued story from yeah. winning. The, mm -hmm. No, you can win, too. Mm -hmm. You can win, too. Yeah, 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 you yeah. can yeah. win, too. Look who just won. But then how do we keep winning? And what yeah. is what does that look like? What if I have wrong definitions of what a win is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, I think, you know, many of those environments they're legitimate they're happening i just wish you know a full story would have been told is told you know in regards to where freedom can take you mm -hmm. not just you know some sometimes i see at those places like the guy gets delivered and, and he's like a pastor in the next six months leading their outreach you know ministry yeah. <laughs> and i'm thinking you know like and he's in the back of the church smoking a cigarette before service you know it's like i'm, I'm always like man where, where's the discipleship process yeah. where's yeah. the you know, I'm glad he's on fire, but if he doesn't have just free, he may have deliverance, but he don't have freedom. Yeah. Then he's going to, and I've seen it. I've seen it so many times. The story is beautiful. They get delivered and they go, man, we he could tell his story on stage all the time. And then you hear from this guy two years later, oh, he's getting a divorce from his wife. He had an affair. He did this or that. And it's like, that wasn't that the guy that every Sunday they've been triumphing as the picture of mm -hmm. deliverance that had a demon and da da da. And now he's like, he was leading the marriage group. Mm -hmm. And then like, now he's divorced. Now he's back on the streets. Now he like, what happened? Yeah. You put him into leadership so fast. You just used his story as a way up. Like mm -hmm. you just have to be as churches, like you had to be very cautious of yeah. Yeah. how you view deliverance and decide, like they all have to work in tandem. Yeah. Not like, oh, you're delivered. And they're like, well, the, you know, that's what Jesus did with the disciples. No, actually, Jesus didn't take any disciple. Any of the 12 disciples didn't have demons. <laughs> he didn't exercise any of the disciples and then put them into leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the only one that he brought close to him who had some type of oppression was Mary, you know. And so, and not much is told there of what that looked like, you know. But mm -hmm. for his 12 disciples, it's like, well, well, he found them and he brought them in leadership. Mm -hmm. Not really. He didn't bring... He, 
taught them and he, he discipled, you know, he discipled them. them. But, yeah. but he didn't yes. put them in the, it, they didn't come with, they didn't have any particular demon, which then you read the gospels of others. Mostly Jesus would just say, Hey, go share your testimony mm-hmm. to the village of your healing. Like that is your one job. Not, now you're Go all lead of the, a church. Yeah, now you're my yeah. 13, 14 disciple. <laughs> yeah. Or now you're our men's pastor. Yeah. You know, like yes. you now gotta go learn Jesus, learn his word. Even the apostle Paul had to spend years, three years with with Jesus, learning him before Jesus would even consider him fit for ministry. And and this is the Apostle Paul, mm-hmm. you know. So there should be a degree of discipleship, like mm-hmm. you're saying, that comes yeah. into all these fronts. And I think a lot of those um international churches do a pretty good job at you know, as someone gets delivered from mm-hmm. that, they bring them into a system of yes. the church and, and do begin to disciple many of, many of those individuals, yeah, you know, do. well, all right. Great episode, y'all. Yeah, that was great. It's, it'll probably pop off a year from now, next right? October. Yeah. <laughs> we'll go back to demons. People are Googling demons again. Yeah. Oh, right. It's titled right. that Demons in Ethiopia, Haiti. You know, yeah. <laughs> that's what the yeah. episode yeah. will yeah. be. And crime in Los Angeles. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all. Thanks, Pastor Tutu. Thanks, thanks, you. thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.